Welcome to the presentation, Avoid Burnout Strategies for Success. My name is George Brunis. I am the owner of GB3 Athletics. I hold a degree in bachelor's in science and sports psychology, emphasized on performance psychology, as well as I have 13 plus years of performance coaching and strength conditioning coaching with individuals that range from youth all the way up to elderly, as well as I like to go ahead and work with individuals on a mental performance standpoint to help make sure that their mind is bulletproof and have the resiliency to handle their daily rigors as well as their profession. Now, currently, I'm getting ready to graduate here in the next couple of weeks with a master's of English emphasized on higher education to adults. And that's something that I found that I think is really uh, you know, close to my heart because I want to go ahead and highlight that we should always constantly be learning. But learning is a skill set. And if we are not doing it constantly, we lose the ability to learn. So the first series of teaching others how to learn and how to develop that skill set is going to be starting with this presentation, Avoid Burnout Strategies for Success. I hope you enjoy. The topics that we're going to be covering throughout this presentation is going to be intro to burnout, understanding burnout, building resiliency, cultivating supportive networks, creating a healthy work environment, preventative measures, a recap, as well as a question and answers. So when we talk about burnout, we must define what burnout is to get everybody on the universal language. And let's go ahead and define what that is. Burnout is a state of emotional, physical, and mental exhaustion caused by excessive and prolonged stress. So when we go ahead and look at stress, we have two types. We have acute and we have chronic. And when we go ahead and dive down the path of those two, one's going to be a quick onset and the second's going to be a prolonged period of stress that has continued to be coming about and accumulating over time and we've done nothing about it. Now, the great thing about this is the fact that when stress does occur, you got to notice what that feels like from a state perspective and the way your body feels. Most of the times you're going to feel drained. You'll be unmotivated. You're going to go ahead and realize that you're not going to want to go ahead and go into your job or you're going to want to put effort into other things throughout your day because of the fact that you are lacking that mental and physical energy, which means that you are no longer able to meet the constant demands of your environment as well. So we have to understand that there is, is, there is a lot of information out here on burnout. There is a lot of statistics on it as well. And we have to understand that most individuals, no matter what their profession is, but within the tactical professional realm, as well as in your everyday general pop world, individuals experience at least over 50% of burnout at some point within their careers and their lifetime. Now, why has that happened? It's just a societal and cultural thing. We fall into the rabbit hole of understanding that, hey, we must constantly go, 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 and we must always say yes, and we tend to forget about ourselves, which then, you know, when we're sick and we're tired and we're injured or some kind of life-threatening uh, event happens, we realize that we need to go ahead and make a change. Now, the reason why I want to highlight the idea of burnout and understanding that this causes a lot more issues down the road if it's not taken care of is the fact that we can actually control it from the very beginning. And what I'm saying by that is the fact that when we go ahead and talk about burnout, again, it is a stressor, right? It is an accumulation of stressors. So whenever we start to, to get to that point of no return, maybe we need to slow down, take a breath and become a little more present and, and look around us and figure out how do I go ahead and not take in any more stress. And sometimes that means that we might have to go and get some rest and regeneration and actually lower the noise, not just in the mind, but also in the environment around us due to the fact of the type of beings we are. And from a feeling perspective and energy, we, we can feel that and becomes very overwhelmed. So addressing burnout is very critical, super critical for individuals and not just the organization, right? If the individual within the organization is burnt out and you have 50% of your individuals in that organization burnt out, what does it do to your organization? And the issue with that is the fact that now your work tempo and the goals and the projects in which that you're reaching and trying to shoot for are going to start to decrease in terms of mission accomplishment and actually getting the outcomes that you want for it because the individuals and the individual themselves no longer feels motivated or is having the energy to go ahead and put forth into that project or let's say you're a tax professional, such as a border patrol agent, a firefighter, a law enforcement officer, or in the military, or if you're just a normal soccer mom who enjoys, you know, lifting weights, having family stuff, and not just doing those things, but also you push the, the realms of other things in your life and it's just overwhelming. Stress is stress. This goes for anything. So when we go ahead and talk about stress and we talk about how it can lead into a, a series of consequences of decreased productivity, impaired relationships, and negative effects on the physical and mental health, 
don't just take that from the physical and the and the mental of the individual themselves. Look at it from the organizational standpoint, because that's going to be a very, very important thing that a lot of individuals and organizations tend to forget. So again, when we talk about burnout, the impact of burnout extends beyond the individual, again, affecting productivity, job satisfaction, and overall well-being, as well as contributing to the increase of absentness and turnover rates within the organization and the culture and that society. So when we go ahead and look at what burnout is, we want to go to make sure that we're on the same wavelength and on the same universal language to understand that, yes, burnout is a real thing. It is a high level of fatigue on someone, and it causes us not to have the ability to continue to retain memory or learn new skills. Burnout manifests itself in various ways, including physical, emotional, and behavioral symptoms. We're going to talk about understanding burnout and recognizing the signs and symptoms. So if you're an individual who goes ahead and checks off more than three of these symptoms or signs, you might be on the realm of burnout or you're already burnt out and over fatigued and overwhelmed. So the first sign is going to be chronic fatigue and exhaustion. Now, this is a really big one that I want to talk about because most of the time, Individuals are going to be constantly fatigued and exhausted if they're working a high tempo job or they live a high output lifestyle and there's no rest in there whatsoever, which then leads into the next symptom and sign, which is going to be increased irritability and frustration. Now, these two paired together now start to lead down to decreased motivation. And now when we have decreased motivation, we lack the ability to actually want to connect and attach to others, which then makes us want to detach because now our irritability and our frustration with our environment and ourselves inside just makes us want to go ahead and get away from everybody. Now, when we go ahead and get into that position, the difficulty to concentrate actually is a really big factor here because now our lack of focus and attention to do a task or to keep our head on a, on a high output energy to go ahead and, and keep that attention and that awareness starts to decrease based off of all of these symptoms and signs that I've stated already. The next big one is going to be the changes in sleep patterns. And that's one of those ones where it's really hard to notice because individuals are usually with sleep issues already and waking up throughout the night. And if that's happening, that might actually be a reason why you're under chronic fatigue and exhaustion. You are feeling uh, irritable and frustrated, your decrease of motivation, your detachment, your difficulty with concentrating. Because again, you might not be getting the proper sleep that you need. And I'm not talking about it from a a a quantity standpoint, I'm talking about it a quality standpoint. And that's another conversation we can have about sleep. And how do we go ahead and learn the, the, the tools to disable our mind before we go to bed, and then enable our mind as we wake up and start our day so that we can go ahead and get our body into different states to allow for us to actually operate at the efficiency that we need to. Now, the next one is going to be feelings of helplessness. All right, this is a big one, a lot of individuals towards the back end of burnout, and who are super overwhelmed and are stuck under that chronic state of stress usually feels like they are, are, are alone because they haven't found anything to help them. Individuals don't understand it because they don't know how to communicate it themselves. And that's a really big issue. And what ends up happening from that is that manifestation within themselves starts to actually come out from a physical side of the house. And we start to see symptoms such as muscle aches, headaches, muscle tension, as well as GI tracts. And I want to go ahead and share an example of this is I had an individual come into the gym the other day. And as I was, when he walked in, I could tell he was already in pain. You can tell he was stressed. You can tell his signs and symptoms were kind of him on the edge of, of being overwhelmed and in chronic pain and chronic stress. Again, those mixtures also lead to burnout because it's very hard to kind of figure out what's going on. So right away, what we did is we went deep into some breathing practices, which you'll learn here in a little bit on how to build resiliency within this realm of stress and understanding burnout and to relieve the pressure of stress. But what I did was we focused on getting the nervous system to downregulate because what's happening is, is all these signs and symptoms are just highlighting is the nervous system's upregulation in the sympathetic state. And what happens with that is we fall into the fight or flight and it's always making us feel like we're on edge. And what happens is we lack the ability to actually transition down into the parasympathetic state, which is our rest recovery and digestion state. So that's the reason why I highlight the fact that you usually see gastro issues from a chronic burnout. That could be IBS, that could be just certain issues of stomach aches, heartburn. It could be a lot of different things that you can you can see from within a physical symptoms due to the internal system being all crazy and, and, and overwhelmed with stress, which leads you into burnout. Now, again, 
burnout can result from multiple different factors, including work related stress, which we know. So as a tactical professional, you're going to find yourself already always in a state of heightened uh, stress due to the fact of your job's demands. Now, this is where you have to learn how to navigate to turn it off when you actually go home and get outside of that job as a tactical professional right? That's where that mental flexibility and the ability to actually switch off your 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 uh, identity as a border patrol agent or as a, a military personnel, law enforcement, firefighter, first responder, or just an individual who works in a very high demanding, high performing job, you need to learn how to actually have that switch on both ends. And it's actually a very uh, healthy thing. And I want to go ahead and label that concept wander or rigor. And if you have too much rigor in your life, you're unable to do things. If you have too much wander in your life, you're unable to do things. So we need a happy balance of those two. Because if we don't, we start to see the lack of control over work tasks. Your job expectations are, are no longer there. Your conflicts with not just yourself, but also colleagues and others starts to actually uh, manifest itself into the environment with your supervisors. And then the organization as a whole, the environment starts to be really weird and it creates this unhealthy work environment to where now your perception towards your leadership or your leadership's perception to you becomes very inadequate, which now leads to, to a burnout from an organizational standpoint. In our last slide, we talked about establishing a work-life balance and understanding how to manage the chaos of stress, as well as recognizing the signs and symptoms. Now, we're going to go ahead and create an awareness around building resiliency and developing some healthy behaviors that you can go ahead and input into your daily lifestyle to allow for you to troubleshoot when you are feeling overwhelmed and stress is all over the place and you're not able to control it. These uh, pretty much behaviors or tools that I'm going to be giving you are going to help with you developing a routine within your day as well as, as developing a lifestyle to set yourself up to, uh, to handle the highs and the lows of stress as well as burnout when it does come. Because again, it is inevitable. Some people will, Some people say that they won't ever experience it. I don't believe that. I believe everybody will experience it sometime in their life. And what happens is the individuals that learn to actually manage it have developed the, the resiliency, such as some of these skill sets that I'm going to talk about that they implement into their life. And this has some, been something that I found that has been super beneficial and healthy for myself to go and handle, you know, again, the high output of work that I like to do and understanding that my personality and the way my body works, that sometimes I need a balance of, of really high output energy. And then I also need a really long period period of time or short period of time of rest and recovery. So I've had learned how to implement, you know, my life to where I have high low days to where I can go ahead and set that up. And we'll dive into that a little bit more here shortly. Now, the first thing I do want to talk about is going to understand to be is stress management techniques, right? And a lot of individuals look at stress management techniques as something that, you know, is, is not doable for their lifestyle because it's just not going to fit into their day. They have this idea that they have to be meditating and the mindfulness that we're, we're going to be highlighting here is something from some woohoo thing that, you know, oh, I got to be all encompassing this happy go lucky person. I have to meditate for an hour. That's not what I'm talking about from a mindfulness and a meditation meditation standpoint. Again, my big thing here is how do we go ahead and develop a universal language so when we see certain words, we're not triggered or, or, or the perception of those words create a different outlook and understanding that, okay, cool, I know what those words mean for me. So when we go ahead and talk about the first one, which is stress management techniques, when we look at mindfulness, all I'm talking about from there is this, the ability to be in the present, all right? So when we're in our jobs or we're with our families or we're out with our friends having a good time, what we need to do is we need to be able to be fully present, not thinking about the past experiences as well as not thinking about future experiences, meaning that when you're in that moment, that's all you're thinking about. So yes, if you're at work and you have a deadline that is due in the next three days, or being in the present of wanting to work towards it and get that done is great, but not thinking about that when you're at home with your kids or with your wife or vice versa, you're at your home with your, you're at home with your kids and your, and your husband, you go ahead and want to highlight the fact that you need to go ahead and be able to put those into many little boxes to come back to when it's time to put that uniform back on or put that other mask back on our identity or however you want to look at it. 
But this is going to be a really big piece into understanding what mindfulness is. Again, mindfulness is just being able to be as present as possible in that moment. So an example that I want you guys to see or at least notice or uh, a strategy or, or a, a, a game you can play is whenever you find yourself drifting off while you're at work while working on something, bring yourself back to that present moment. The more you do that, the better you'll get at being in the present moment because you're recognizing that that thought's going away compared to in the past where you just hang on to that thought and float away with it instead of releasing and coming back to that present moment. Again, it's a very healthy thing. And next big thing is going to be meditation. Now, the meditation that I'm talking about here is really simple. They're just simple check-ins. There's something that I used to do in the military and our units used to do as a military whenever we got done with a long patrol or whenever we were doing a security halt and we called them tactical pauses or we just talked called them battle damage assessment to check on ourselves. And the, the thing there was to go ahead and be like, all right, is myself good? Do I need anything? Do I need water? Do I need to, you know, check? Am I injured? Do any of those things happening? All right, is my gear good? All right, cool. My gear is good. Are the buddies to the left and right of me? Are they good? All right, sweet. I'm ready to rock and roll. I took time to check in real quick, bring myself back into that present moment and keep moving forward. Right. So what, what I'm what I'm talking about here is the idea of when, when we go ahead and do these things, we have to utilize our breath. Right. And when I talk about breathing, I'm not talking about it from a standpoint of we need to go ahead and highlight it as, you know, box breathing or Wim Hof or Pitayama breathing or some kind of crazy um, breathing that we see out there. No, what I want you to do is take control of your inhales and exhales and understand that if I just take some long, slow inhales and exhales through my nose, I can go ahead and learn how to actually control the state in which I'm in. And if I increase those inhales and exhales, I can also change the state that I'm in. And if I increase my inhales and exhales quickly and rapidly, I start to see that my stress or my sympathetic state starts to go up, which is getting me ready for stress. And usually what happens is individuals are already in that state and are already breathing at a high, at a high cadence that we need to go ahead and slow them down and bring that cadence down to a little bit more slower, long and controlled inhales and exhales, which brings us back into that nervous system that we talked about in the previous slides and helps us get into the parasympathetic state, which is our rest, recovery and digestion. Again, it doesn't bring you right away, but it helps you move along that scale when you get too high or you get too low. So if you notice that you get to work and you're feeling a little unmotivated and tired, well, maybe increase your rate of oxygen in through your nose and out through your nose for a few minutes to help with getting yourself ready to go for the day. Now, if you notice that you come into work and you're a little too amped up and the day doesn't need that, then we can focus on controlling our inhales and exhales and slowing that cadence down again. Again, a very simple exercise I like to tell anybody is, hey, if we're getting ready to go into, you know, a patrol or if you're getting ready to take, uh, you know, pull someone over or you're getting ready to run into a fire or you're coming onto scene for something, you know, or if you're that high performer who works in a high stress job where you have to give presentations or you got to be super cool and mellow when you're talking with individuals because you're getting ready to deliver a huge pitch. That's where these breath, breath work comes in and these deep, deep breathing exercises actually come in. So the idea here is when we go ahead and want to upregulate our system, we want to take rapid inhales just like such. And then if we want to go ahead and move it the other way towards more of that recovery state and that digestive state of the parasympathetic state, we want to go ahead and have a little bit slower controlled inhales just like such. And what I'm doing there is I'm learning to just control myself. I'm able to bring myself back into the present. And just by doing that, I actually was able to oxygenate myself to keep me in the moment while I'm talking about this presentation. So there you can see how, how fast it actually happens and gets you ready to rock and roll or helps you to relax a little bit. Okay. So now the next big thing that I want to talk about here is going to be time management strategies. Now, man, time management strategies are something that I think is one of the best things that we can do for ourselves, right? And, and I learned this when I was in the Marine Corps as a reconnaissance operator, was that if we had right time management strategies, it allowed for us to make sure that we had all of our ducks in a row before we stepped out on patrol, or if we were getting ready to present a mission, brief actually. And the idea behind that is to, is to be able to time block certain things that you need to get done throughout the day that are very important. And I call that gaining the first down. Now, I can't take credit for this, a buddy of mine named Ryan Muncy wrote a book called Go Fuck Your Feelings. And within it, he talked about moving the chains. And moving the chains was 
three main priority tasks, which we'll get into, but three main plays gets us a first down if you go ahead and do four yards every time. Now, the idea behind gaining the first down is we should always be looking to gain the first down, meaning that we need to go ahead and time manage our day with the priorities that actually it, that are actually more of an urgency or an importance, which again, we'll talk about here in a little bit, but what these things do allows for you to move the chains. They become football plays within your day, within your lifestyle and within your week to know that, all right, cool, I'm putting in the right things and the right energy towards the right stuff to keep me moving forward. So let's say you come into the week, right? And you have a major project due at the end of the week, close a business on Friday at 5 PM. Cool. Well, you've been working on it for the past week and now you're in that final crunch. Well, maybe that's what's going to be getting you that first down is that play is working on it a little bit more while you're at work and learning how to make adjustments with other with other uh prior with other tasks or other projects that you might have within that. And the same thing goes with work. I understand that sometimes when we are operating at a high tempo from the from a border patrol agency standpoint or a military professional standpoint or a firefighter standpoint or a patrolling standpoint of a law enforcement, you know, or the first responder, it's really hard to figure out what does that really mean in terms of like gaining the first down or putting in the plays that help us prioritize our task. And something with that is I like to actually highlight the fact that do those things outside of your work block. So if you're a high performer, you're going to implement this within your work block so that you can go ahead and continue performing. But if you're someone like I just mentioned from the tax professional world, we have to understand that those gaining the first down doesn't come from our job. Our job's constantly in stress and we have very minimal control of that. But what we can do is outside of that, that means that we can control our sleep, we can control our nutrition, we can control our hydration, we can control how we perceive the world, as well as we can go ahead and throw in a lot of different activities and things to help us relieve stress so that when we get back into our job again that is constantly high stress, we have the ability to handle it. So again, gaining the first down, Time blocking is very different for everybody, but what I'm talking about here is we go ahead and utilize the warning order mentality. It means that we go ahead and back plan. So what do I need to do to go ahead and set myself up some, from success to finish this project on time? So if that project's due or... I need to go ahead and make sure that I'm ready to rock and roll for work. What are the things that I need to put into place to get me ready to, for me, example, when I was at working in the recon teams was push out friendly lines and be ready to be, be, ready to be as uh, aware and as focused and have the concentration to take care of the guy to the left and right of me because we were in a very heightened state just as a, as the battlefield. Now, some of you guys can understand what I'm talking about that because of the job fields y'all play in, as well as I want to take that same experience and just change the, the description a little bit for the high performer where you're getting ready to walk in and give a public speaking engagement where you're in front of a whole bunch of people and you're, it's very critical that you are on point, focused, and ready to rock and roll. Again, setting yourself up from a back planning standpoint, how do I set myself up for success? Do I need sleep? Do I need food? Do I need to make sure this presentation's super clean and, and I have it down? Have I been practicing what it is I want to say so that I'm not slipping up? Again, it all comes down to those kinds of things. The next big thing is going to be your self-care practices. And the self-care practices are huge because a lot of individuals don't take care of themselves. They do a lot of self-destructive practices and those self-destructive practices are usually substance abuse, not working out or working out and hitting it super hard that it just causes more stress on their system to allow them not to recover. And the list can go on. We can put whatever we want there, whatever that addiction, whatever that thing is that makes you feel good after a long day at work potentially might not be what actually is the best thing for you. So again, one thing I want to talk about here is going to be regular exercise. And why is regular exercise super important? Because again, it helps reduce stress, it improves mood, and it boosts energy. And from a physiological standpoint, there's a lot of things that happen within your body as you start to elevate your heart rate in a natural way, as well as in the brain to where it sends a bunch of different signals to the body to go ahead and get it going. And again, getting in, getting in some kind of physical activity with a heightened heart rate, I'm not saying a max heart rate, but a heightened heart rate that is between that 120 to 150 will go ahead and help re uh, release some endorphins in the system so that you can get your day going and it helps you move forward. Now, the next big thing I'm going to talk about on there is going to be eating habits. Man, you know, self-care practices are one of those things where we can control what we put into our mouth, all right? And the issue with that is whenever we're in high states of stress, when we feel like we're burnt out, our brain wants sugar, our brain wants carbohydrates. So that's why the first thing that we always turn to is something like alcohol or some kind of high sugar 
food or some type of processed food because it sends the signals to your brain that that's what you need. When realistically, you just need nutrients in the system that are very high quality. So what I'm talking about that is consuming a balanced diet of proteins, carbohydrates, and fats that are from real foods, as well as micronutrients, such as electrolytes from element or raylite or salt or types of different minerals that go into your foods that you utilize. Again, a lot of these things are going to help supplement and get you to go ahead and get rid of that burnout because you are now fueling yourself and nourishing yourself in a very healthy manner. Now, the next self-care practice is sleep and sufficient sleep is key, is, is, is key, right? And what I mean by that is the fact that, again, we're not looking at the quality of sleep. I'm looking, or I'm not looking at the quantity of sleep, I'm sorry. We're looking at the quality of sleep. Again, how much REM sleep am I getting within a four to six hour block? Because that's all I'm allotted to sometimes during a work window, right? Or, hey, I have time now to, to sleep seven to eight hours. I want to get some really high quality sleep. Well, that comes from maintaining a very, very important bedtime routine and wake time routine because it's a state of being again when we go to sleep. So when we go ahead and talk about getting really sufficient sleep, we talk about increasing cognitive function. We talk about being able to be more emotionally stable and overall our health gets to increase. And that's something that's really awesome and something that I'm really big a fan of is being able to get some really good sleep because if we don't, then we lose the ability to actually work and perform at the, 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 the level that we want to and our job actually wants us to as well. So again, that's something that's going to be really important as well. Setting boundaries. This is something that has taken me time to learn how to say no. We are in a world of always saying yes, that we need to go ahead and learn how to balance. Again, just like the idea of wander rigor, we need to learn the balance of yes and no. And if I say yes, is this lining up with my goals in my life, my profession, my family, my morals, my values? And is it giving me a self-care is, or is it going to go ahead and harm me if I do say no or say yes. If, and that's the kind of the balance that I'm talking about here is being able to understand how to balance out yes and no. Sometimes the yes is good because it benefits you. At the same time, you also have to understand that saying no is going to benefit you also and there's nothing wrong with that. Again, it's just a happy balance and learning how to implement into your day. And the more you learn how to be more present, a little bit more mindful, you'll be able to understand when that yes comes in and when that no comes in. And the way I like to utilize that and something that's helped me out is now I've slowed down a little bit more. When someone asks me to do something, I kind of check in and be like, all right, does this align with the goals that I want to be with or be in the next year or the next six months or the next week? Because if it does, I'm going to say yes. But if it doesn't, I'm going to say no. And that has been something that's been really beneficial for me in terms of creating boundaries, um, as well as understanding my work-life balance, right? I'm no longer a tax professional. I'm not working at a high tempo anymore. But I do run a full-time business where I'm working with athletes all the time and everyone's demanding, demanding, demanding. And I'm having to give, give, give that I've had to learn how to say yes and no a lot more than I used to because of the fact that if I always say yes, 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 or if I always say no, 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 then I'm going to be burnt out. So I need to learn how to balance it all. Again, that's something that's really important. Again, when we're talking about building resiliency, that is probably one of the biggest ones I want to highlight is the self-care practices and learning what those are and building a tool kit or a toolbox of self-care practices and getting rid of the self-destruction practices. Now, the final one here in building resiliency is going to be prioritizing tasks. And when we prioritize tax, task, we want to go ahead and look at it from an urgency and an important standpoint. And the reason why I say that is because this urgency aspect is something that needs to get us done, right? We're kind of in that final window of that project and you need to get certain things done. That's what's going to help you move the, the chains to get that first down completed. Awesome. Please, please get that in there. And the other type of importance is we can now label things in high, low, and medium of importance. And then we can make adjustments, right? So again, it goes urgency, high, moderate, low. And that's just exactly the way it's working to allow for yourself to focus on what actually matters within that moment and within that week to accomplish the task at hand so that you can then take the time of self practices and apply the time management uh, strategies as well as the stress management techniques to go ahead and help you navigate and build this resiliency. Again, really what we're talking about is developing skill sets to go ahead and troubleshoot and problem solve when you are in a state of chronic burnout because you forgot to say no or you forgot to think about how to manage manage boundaries and you forgot to take care of yourself as well as all the other things that we've conversated about so far within this slide. Now, again, understanding that we need to go ahead and focus and prioritize our time to the things that matter most to us. 
Again, that is a question that you have to ask yourself. What matters most to me? Because that's how I'm going to prioritize the task and the things in my day that I'm going to put energy towards. Cultivating supportive networks. This is something that I really want to talk about. It's something that I've learned a lot about in my recent uh, master's degree when it talks about organizational communication as a whole and how do we keep an organization's culture high to go ahead and meet those operational demands that is required within that profession. And this is the reason why I want to highlight this is, again, when we go ahead and talk about cultivating supportive networks in a positive manner and actually looking at things in a, in a positive connotation when we talk about seeking professional help, building those social connections, communicating openly, and seeking feedback and guidance, this is something that's super important because of the fact that right now, I, I, I've been in groups before, organizations where you know requiring professional help is looked upon right? Uh, building your social networks is actually built around booze and always going out and partying every night. And then communication is actually lacking as well as the feedback is not taking in a very positive manner. No one knows how to actually handle uh, uh, constructive feedback and guidance. So what I want to go ahead and highlight is going to be this idea that within an organization and the culture, we need to develop networks to help us provide the resources and the positive outlook to relieving stress when we need to, especially when we recognize someone has gone through a really high stress state of an experience, event, or situation. We as individuals, this is where that peer-on-peer -peer, um, first aid comes into play to allow for us to help and take uh, some of that slack off individuals or tell someone it is okay to go ahead and take some rest or go ahead and take some time off. Or, hey, maybe you need to take a walk and take a break from what you're working on because it looks like you're a little bit overwhelmed and you're overstressed, as well as being able to tell yourself that. Again, if you can recognize those things, as we've talked about from the signs and symptoms, and you start to implement building those resilient tools, you can find that now we can go to implement it into cultivating supportive networks. So the first one we're going to talk about is seeking professional help. Now, when we talk about professional help, this can be counseling, this can be therapy, it's whatever it is that you actually are open to. But again, you have to be open to asking for help. And I think that's one of the difficult things we do in today's society is asking for help. I'll say it myself, it's really hard to ask for help sometimes, but I'm learning to how to do it. And it set me up for success because it's allowing me to do other things than just always the main things that take up all my time because of the fact that I've been able to ask for help. Now, outside of asking for help from peers, I'm talking about professional help, right? Everybody needs someone to talk to who is like an accountability buddy or someone that they can talk to as an outside source to give them a different perspective that's fresh. And that's where therapy and counseling comes into play, as well as the idea of having a coach or mentor, right? And these things allow for us to develop a safe space to where we can open up freely and talk with individuals. But without that, we lack that ability to actually connect. And that's where building social connections actually comes into play, because I want to talk about the idea that networking with colleagues is going to be something super beneficial. We all do it, yes, but it's not from a standpoint that we're going to go out and drink with everybody and create this idea in this network where now we're 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 talking about each other, we're we're complaining about work, we're complaining about leadership. No, that's not that's not that's not what I'm talking about. Building social connections means you're going out and doing things together that hardens and helps build resiliency within that work and within that organization. And that could be going out for a long hike. There was, a, a, there, that, that, there was something that I, I heard the other day, and it was talking about Beat Monday, right? So take the weekend to go do some hard challenges as a group and be ready to rock and roll back at Monday at work. Again, doing these types of things is fun. You can go play sports. Any type of things that highlights a positive outcome and improves, re, uh, improves resiliency and helps relieve stress and avoid burnout, right? And again, those are different activities you can throw into there, but I'm trying to say is it's not going out and drinking and, and all those kinds of things. It's, it's a little bit different than that, all right? And now what this does is it helps open the door to actually start talking about people's hobbies and interests, right? Once you start to get to know about somebody, for example, you know, maybe someone on your team loves playing guitar. You didn't know that, but you love listening to the guitar being played. Cool, now when you guys are at a barbecue together or you guys or doing something as a group, maybe tell your buddy to bring his guitar so everyone can enjoy some live music. Again, those are the types of examples that I'm talking about that can actually help develop a positive network and actually create a very positive organization within your group 
because of the fact that we start to have these similarities in hobbies and interests. Again, it's just a way to go ahead and create communication. And that's something that I'm really highlighting right now is the fact that the more we communicate with each other, the more it changes the way that we see the world, which actually helps promote a positive outcome for that organization. Now, the next big piece here is going to be communicating openly, right? And the idea behind this is being able to not be afraid to say what you feel, right? And this is the idea behind a safe space is sometimes there's individuals that don't feel 100% the same as you do, but they're afraid to voice their concerns or their feedback on it because they're not sure how you're going to take it. And this is where it's one of those things where you have to be able to take feedback and criticism just as much as you give it, as well as just as much guidance you give. And you have to be able to take guidance because if you're not able to take guidance or not able to take criticism and you're not able to provide feedback, then you develop you develop this, this wall that sets up the organization as well as that network for failure because now you have no open lane of communication. No one's able to express their needs. No one's able to express their concerns. And it slows down the ability of growth within that organization and that group of individuals, Right. So that's something that's really big. And that highlights us going into the next thing, which is seeking feedback and guidance. Man, this is one of those things that I found in the reconnaissance community that was really, really beneficial was being able to take, uh, you know, constructive criticism as well as feedback and guidance, because it made me become a better operator. It made me better at my job, which then allowed for me to be better for those to the left and right of me. And again, that's kind of what I'm talking about here when we go ahead and be able to communicate openly. Go ahead and take, hey, what did I mess up on? What can I do better? All right, what's the guidance that you can give me so that I can apply it and be better so that you are able to go ahead and believe and trust in me and I can actually be a true asset within the team, within the organization and not just a liability. And I promote value for you in that manner. Again, that's something that's really big and I think that's something that lacks within networks is this ability to communicate openly and also seek feedback and guidance and constructive criticism. So when we go and talk about these, these, these different types of tools and these different types of resources, it comes down to that. Cultivating supportive networks, utilizing, seeking professional help, building social connections, communicating openly, and seeking feedback and guidance. In our last slide, we talked about cultivating supportive networks. And in this one, we're going to go ahead and talk about healthy work environments. And now you probably could be like, all right, well, how does the cultivating supportive networks and healthy work environments differ? Well, that's actually a really good question because the way I like to look at this is a healthy work environment is going to be just specifically within your profession, right? Cultivating supportive networks is going to be something that you want to go ahead and develop, not just within your work environment, but also within your personal environment as well, because having that type of, uh, Transferability allows for you to, again, manage burnout and manage stress so that you cannot have that prolong of stress, which leads to over fatigue. So within a healthy work environment, this is something that's super important because a lot of individuals are not within a healthy work environment or they've created a very unhealthy work environment for themselves due to just their own behaviors and habits and lifestyle. Again, the great thing about that is that all can be reversed and changed once we start getting everybody on that universal language of creating a positive network that is supporting from you know being able to have that work-life balance so that we are all operating on a high level together at all times. So again, when we go and look at uh, you know a healthy work environment, we have to understand this work-life balance. And you've heard me talk about this multiple times. But if we're prioritizing work balance as well as life balance, you know, not just the employees that you work that you work with, right? In terms of as a boss or as a leader, your your individuals underneath you or alongside you, what ends up happening is their health and happiness is now in your hands as well, meaning that you have to go ahead and lead by example, and that puts you into the state and actually lets you be the person to go ahead and start creating that healthy, supportive network within yourself, and then it starts to grow out within the organization, so then everybody starts to feed off of it. And that's something that I really believe in, is the fact if we can go ahead and develop skill sets for ourselves and start highlighting them in front of the others, Others are going to pick up on it. It's the same exact way when we go to develop destructive behaviors within an environment, everyone else feeds into it. So why would not we not want to develop healthy behaviors and a healthy work environment so everyone's on the same page? So what we're going to talk about here is going to be strategies for positive work environments. Now, again, within the degree of, of understanding communication and English to higher education for adults, this is something that they have highlighted a lot is this organizational support. And when we talk about organizational support, that means that the hierarchy of leadership 
That doesn't mean that someone's always going to be the dictator and they're in charge all the time. That means that everybody on that hierarchy has an input and everyone's listening so that we can make the right changes. Because again, if I don't listen to someone within the work environment and I, and they're actually trying to keep me safe and I don't listen to it, what happens over time and something bad happens? Well, that now makes me look bad as a leader and then it creates a, a negative work environment because I don't want to be open to others. Again, communicating openly is a, a really positive thing to creating organizational support. And that's what I want to talk about in that manner is, again, we're prioritizing your individual's well-being as well as yourself. We're offering those supportive networks. You know, what ends up happening in these in, in, within these systems, it only gives you a greater outcome and honestly increase in work output as well as mission accomplishment across the board because we're now taking care of the individuals, again, as the human and not the professional. And we want to highlight that is the human is first and everything else is second. So when we go to move into flexible work arrangements, right, we have to have this balance of wander and rigor. I talked about this in some previous uh, slides about that. And I took this concept from an author named Natalie Nixon, and she wrote a book called The Creative Leap. And an example that I remember from that book and something that she highlighted in there was a few Fortune 500 companies actually have this idea is if the surf is good, go out and surf, leave all your projects alone. And one of the companies that she talked about in there was Rip Crow, I believe, and they were able to oversee uh, one of the oceans, uh, one of the famous beaches that you can go surf on, they oversee it. And a lot of the individuals that work within that, that company obviously are surfers. So what, what the, the, the motto is to help them have flexible work arrangements is if the surf is good, go out and surf, come back and do your projects later. Because again, they're focusing on Im improving well-being and giving individuals the ability to be flexible, to handle that balance of wander and rigor, meaning that surfing for them is wanderous. It's a fun activity. Working on a project, developing new products is actually sometimes too rigorous over time. So we need that happy balance so that we're able to create. And again, as individuals within these different types of environments, from a tactical professional to a high-performing environment, we have to understand that it's all about creativity. And if we're not creative enough, we lose the ability to actually perform at the level we want. Now, another big piece here, all right, for positive work environments is recognition and appreciation. Man, I don't know how many times that I've been in an environment or in a team where the lack of recognition and appreciation is, is, is null, meaning that we are not telling each other how proud we are of each other, how grateful we are, and what it is that they bring to the table for us. We're not talking about each other's values. We're too busy talking about our values, but we're never talking about others. And we tend to forget that the reason why my values are so strong is because I'm surrounded by individuals whose values are also strong. So if I can learn about their values, I can then recognize them as a human and their well-being and appreciate who they are within that work environment to make it even better. All right. And this is where that open, uh, open dialogue and encouraging open dialogue, being able to sit there and be like, man, I'm really appreciative of you for you to like help me keep keep myself mellow. Or I'm really I really appreciate the fact that you have the skill set to work Google Sheets and I don't. Or, hey, man, I appreciate you having my six on that last patrol without me having to tell you. Those things go a long way and that highlights a positive work environment, right? Being able to encourage open dialogue about anything. We talked about that in that previous slide about it. But again, this lets us go ahead and move into addressing, you know, work-related stressors. And when we talk about work-related stressors, man, we're they're all over the place. But if we can have an ability to honestly talk with each other in a way that lets us relieve the stress. It only sets us up for success, meaning that we are going to go ahead and be able to bring more stressful types of conversations to the table and help to solve them faster than let them simmer and boil and become even bigger. And again, that is the biggest thing here is what happens is when we start having negative work environments and organizational support and networks start to decrease, it's due to the fact that there's too many stressors that are unable to be put out and no one has the skill sets to actually control it. Right. And that's actually the very important task that we need to do as individuals ourselves within the organization itself or the, the environment we work in is the fact that we need to control the stressors and be able to open freely and communicate with each other so that we can go ahead and move the, the, the organization forward in a positive manner. Right. And again, that comes down to looking at providing resources for wellness. I understand that there's a lot of organizations now that are looking at developing mental health 
resources, physical health resources, just different resources for individuals within their work environment to develop this work-life balance and this wander rigor so that they actually can operate at a high level. Because again, a lot of organizations are starting to notice that once they start losing their, their individuals and their individuals start to detach from the company because they're burnt out, they end up seeing that their business starts to decrease or their organization starts to lose its ability to perform. Or if you're in that tactical professional world, you start to see that life and death actually is, is a little bit closer than it used to be because we're starting to make more mistakes and errors. And then we have to pay for them in a very more drastic way. So that's a really big piece that I want to talk about. And the way that we develop resources is going to be looking at, you know, wellness programs, management workshops, different types of stress management workshops, demonstrating, uh, honestly, a commitment to improving overall well-being within the work environment. If we can highlight that and put that within our values and our morals of the company or of the organization or of the team in which we work in, it's going to set us up for success and give us the balance that we need within the, cult uh, within the culture. Because again, if the culture is, again, I like to call it murky and it's not good, it's not fun to be in. It's not fun to be around. No one wants to work. No one's motivated. Everyone wants to go away. And again, that stress within that environment starts to take over and consume the individuals. And it takes away from what it is that the job is needing to be done. Right. And again, for us to have all this, we have to understand as human beings, the importance of our own self-care. Again, this comes back to us. It comes back to me as the individual that for me to be the best version of me, I need to take care of myself. I need to give myself the ability and the tool sets and the skills to make sure that I'm ready to handle daily lifestyle as well as daily life stressors. So again, when it comes down to when we talk about importance of, of, of care, we, we can go down the rabbit hole, but we already talked about sleep is a huge one, nutrition, stress management, improving heart health, meaning going out for more walks, making sure that you're doing Physical activity that keeps your heart rate, again, between that 120 all the way up to that 150 beats per minute, it's going to promote very good recovery. It's going to help you manage stress that much better. And let's talk about breaks and vacations, because how many times does individuals actually take breaks if they're behind a desk all day? Not very many, right? It's something I have to get on with my wife about sometimes. It's like, hey, you've been on your computer for the past three hours. Have you taken a break and gone for a walk yet today? And oh no, I haven't. Thanks for reminding me. It's the same thing you can do with those with those to the left and right of you if you work in within you know uh, an, an office space or if you're in a team and you guys have been working really hard. Learn how to recognize how to go ahead and give those breaks to each other because you also need it. And then as well as vacation, everybody gets paid time off. Everybody can take some time off. Remember that. It doesn't mean that you are stuck to your desk or stuck to that job and you don't get no vacation time. Take vacation. Vacation is super important. And if you don't take it, you start to see yourself burn out because you've never changed your environment and you get stuck in the same repetitive manner and the process and, and, and patterns over and over again. And that too becomes very daunting and leads to burnout. Our body is meant for adaptation and evolving. We need change. So understanding that breaks, vacation, and self-care practices allows for us to go ahead and create adaptation and evolve to become better for ourselves as well as those around us in this work environment. When we talk about preventative measures, we have to go ahead and understand that this is a big part of actually developing a work-life balance, developing a positive work environment, and cultivating positive support networks. It's really important. And that's what I want to highlight here when we talk about this is understanding how to recognize and taking action. And this actually comes from developing your own uh, skill sets and tools to actually implement within your daily lifestyle as well as your daily um work tempo, and whatever it is that you have to deal with in your daily lifestyle. Again, this allows for you to go ahead and recognize the stress that you're under, understand where you're at, recognize where you're at, and take action, all right? So what we're going to talk about first is going to be self-assessments. And the self-assessments that I'm going to talk about is really simple. It is doing a check-in, just asking yourself a couple of questions. You know, and the first one is when you wake up in the morning, and there's a set of three questions, and it's easy. You're going to go ahead and ask yourself, are you happy? hungry and is your sex drive high low or is it non-existent and the same thing when you wake up hungry are you hungry at all because if you are no there's something going on there and if you're waking up in a neutral mood or you're sad or you're not happy there's something going on there as well because it gives you insight into that internal system if you're waking up happy hungry and your sex drive is high that means you're ready pretty much to rock and roll and take after the day. So that is one self-assessment. The next self-assessment that I like to talk about and utilize is the RPE scale. On a scale of 0 to 10, 10 being the highest stress 
and zero being the least stress, you can go ahead and, and, and put on, you know, within that scale throughout your day where that stress was at. And you can break it down into two categories. You can talk about physical stress as well as psychological stress. And when we talk about psychological stress, I like that one more because of the fact it does give you a better understanding of the kind of stress you're under. From a physical stress, sometimes the physical stress might be high, but it wasn't really uh, psychologically demanding. But when we have a high psychological demanding type day, you know, it, it takes a toll on us mentally, even if we don't have any physical stress on our bodies. Now, if we have both physical stress is super high and psychological stress is super high, obviously we are going to need to recover from it. And that's something that you can recognize. But again, I like to implement that scale. And what happens is you can start implementing that throughout your day. So, you know, on a Monday, when you go to work, just put your scale down on it. All right, how was today's work, uh, day of stress today at work from a mental and a physical standpoint? Oh, I'm gonna go ahead and put mental, it was a seven. Physical, it was a three. Awesome. On Tuesday, what was my stress like coming out of the day? Oh, it was at a nine and my physical stress was at a four. Cool. On, let's say, Thursday, you come in. Let's say Wednesday was off, so you had no um, st stress was a, a two and you know physical stress was a four because you got to go out and hike, do some other things, and you got to put a little more physical stress, but it helped relieve that mental stress. Sweet. Now, on Thursday, you have to be back at work. It's another nine physical stress at a four. And then Friday, same thing, it's a nine and you come down. What you can do is you can then take all of those numbers across the board and add them up together and it gives you a stress unit. And the higher those stress units are gonna be, it's probably the more stress you're under. The lower those stress numbers are means the less stress you're under. And the cool thing about that is you can go ahead and put in different types of activities and behaviors and tools to help lower that stress over time throughout that week. So the accumulation of stress isn't so high when you come to the end of a work week or end of the week as a, as a whole. And that's a really cool thing I like to utilize. And that's me blending in the stress levels because now I get to recognize the stress levels that I'm under. And you'll start to see that as you start to go ahead and release some of that stress pressure, your tolerance to stress actually grows and improves. So to where you can actually notice that, oh, that nine stress that I used to be under is no longer a nine, it's now a seven. Oh, cool. Again, we're now adapting, evolving and becoming better. Now, another way to recognize and take action is going to be developing ways to find those early warning signs and patterns. Now, the example I can use is I know if I'm going to go ahead and work four days back to back of, you know, long hours on the computer and coaching in person and talking with athletes. And I do that four days back to back with no breaks in between. And I don't do no working out and everything is given to everyone. And I give no time to myself. That's recognizable, super easy. Everyone probably can understand and know what exactly what I'm talking about with that. But the idea behind that is to go ahead and learn how to recognize other, other signs before getting into four days back to back. So for example, if I go on a Monday and I'm on the computer for a few hours, I'm coaching in person for a couple hours or a few hours, and I'm talking to athletes and I'm spending time with my wife and my kids, some of that might actually generate a little bit of stress to where I put no preventative measures or any kind of, of resilient skill sets in there to go ahead and relieve that stress, right? And then all of a sudden now I start noticing how tired I am how much I don't want to be connected with anybody. I started realizing that I don't even want to do the self-care practice myself because I don't have no energy. Now, that's a very big time warning sign when you're like, wait a minute, I don't even want to take care of myself. That's a sign. Again, the goal is to develop patterns so that you can recognize those early signs and symptoms to set you up to develop the tools and the behaviors to be proactive when it comes to stress management. Again, that's the big piece here. All we're doing is developing skill sets so that we can combat stress, right? It's just like when I'm in a firefight with my team, there's certain things that we learn how to do to set us up to go ahead and be proactive so that certain situations don't happen. And that's the same thing here when we talk about stress. We are just implementing different types of proactive activities and stress management strategies to set us up so that we're not getting ambushed from the right side of certain things that are not in our control. We've now set ourselves up and we're ready for it. So when the unknowing does happen because you just weren't ready for it, you have the ability to tolerate it. And that's a big piece that I want to highlight with that. Now, the next thing is going to go ahead and be is talking about relaxation techniques within your daily environment uh, routine. I don't know how many times I like I, I talk about this, but if we can go ahead and, and develop a, a morning routine before we go into our day, and that means we have to wake up an hour earlier, wake up an hour earlier. That means you go to bed an early hour, an hour earlier, you go to bed an hour earlier. But the idea though for you is to go ahead and focus that you set up these different types of routines that are very 
promoting relax and regeneration in your system, both mentally and physically, so that you can go about your day. And the thing I want to go ahead and highlight, and I'll, I'll share case it here real quick, is you know when I wake up in the morning, first thing I do is take a nice, warm, cold shower. It could be for five minutes, just some cold, some hot, some cold, some hot. For about five minutes, I kind of do some breath work. Once I get out, I go ahead and go downstairs, brush my teeth, get myself dressed. Once I'm done doing that, I go into some kind of stillness practice for five minutes, just some breathing real quick. I might read a book. I might go ahead and write for a little bit. And then from there, I do some kind of stretch or, or movement practice for another five to 10 minutes. And then from there, I go ahead and continue to move myself throughout my day. Now, within that routine, am I putting in water? Am I go ahead and, you know, getting myself ready for the day? Yes, 100%. That might also involve eating breakfast sometimes. But again, you're just implementing different things that set you up for your day. And then as I transition throughout my day, I understand that I need to put in potentially some kind of mini breaks to allow for me to, to relax so I can transition from one task to the next. And that's where those time management techniques come into play. And gaining the first down is not just also prioritizing the urgency of your task, but it's also prioritizing your relaxation techniques and regeneration uh, type activities to get you into the next part of the day to where at the end of the day, if you didn't do any of those things, your stress levels would be a nine. But since you implemented all of these different habits and behaviors throughout your day as you moved about it, you set yourself up to where your stress levels now are a six or a seven. Again, that is something that is very important. A lot of individuals tend to forget, all right? And, and, and what I want to highlight here, again, you'll see this, is, is the resources for wellness. And this idea is being of service, right? Support you know, each other, family, friends. Find resources before burnout actually uh, happens. Again, resources for wellness is important. Move to them. That is where you need to go ahead and move towards. Ask for help. And that comes from the resources of wellness when we're talking about preventative measures to allow for us to go ahead and take action and create a positive work environment and supportive networks. All right. Now, a big one here is learning and adapting, right? We talked about ad adaptation earlier. We talked about learning earlier as well. Now, this is one thing that I really want to highlight. And this is something that I recognize when I was when I, when I do jiu-jitsu is if I do jiu-jitsu too many days in a row or too many weeks in a row and I don't take a break from it, my ability to retain techniques actually decreases. My ability to apply techniques decreases and my reaction time when I'm sparring decreases because my ability to actually comprehend information and put out information from a movement standpoint and thought process slows down because of the fact, again, I'm being coming and I'm leading into burnout, right? So if we can go ahead and learn how to develop ways to learn in different manners, meaning that you have different skill sets and different hobbies and interests within your lifestyle, it keeps you fresh and it keeps you adapting, right? And what's cool about that is the fact that you can go ahead and learn how to play piano, you can learn how to draw, you can learn how to write, you can learn martial arts, you can learn how to work out, you can learn how to eat, you can learn how to be, you know, how to talk to someone better. There's a lot of different things you can do to learn, but I truly believe as human beings and in, in, in the space of avoiding burnout, if we're constantly learning a new skill, it allows for us to relieve stress because we're not constantly always thinking about that one specific task or the, 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 the profession in which that we work in. As professionals in a high-performing environment as well as a tactical professional environment, we need to understand that hobbies are really good for us and different interests outside of that are really good for us. All right. So by implementing those types of things into your lifestyle and into your day, become preventative measures and things that help build resiliency. All right. Now, the next one is being able to be okay with open to new coping skills. And this is what I'm talking about, being open to this conversation about how to implement new techniques and actions and skills that we've been talking about throughout this presentation is, all right, be okay with, maybe maybe I need to do some more mindfulness and be more present in this moment. Maybe I need to do a little bit more timeouts and tactical pauses and, and check-ins for myself. Maybe I need to go ahead and do more breathing practices. That's accepting new coping skills. Maybe I need to do a little bit more writing. Maybe I need to change up my, my eating habits. Maybe I need to do more hydration. Maybe I need to develop some type of uh, you know, nighttime routines before bed, as well as morning routines to set me up for success throughout my day. Again, being open to all of these things allows for you to become better and allows you to adapt. All right, let's recap on burnout. I know that was a lot of information that you have uh, consumed over the last few slides, but I think it's very important, all right? And the great thing about this, this presentation is you can go back and listen to every single one if you want to, to go ahead and catch something new. Again, it's very much like reading a book. You might catch something that 
catches your eye now, but then you listen to it a month from now and you learn something new from it. But the idea behind this is to go ahead and give you the skills, the tool sets to build the resiliency to handle stress and avoid burnout, as well as improve your tolerance to stress. So by implementing these strategies and prioritizing self-care, you can really focus on building resiliency and burning and, and avoiding burnout, right? And the first key takeaway I want to talk about is simple. It's, it's burnout is a state of emotional, physical, mental exhaustion caused by prolonged stress. If you can remember that from a definition standpoint, you're going to be able to recognize it and feel it. All right, meaning you're understanding the signs and the causes that makes it that much more susceptible to you leading to burnout as well as those around you. And you can implement new uh, preventative measures to allow for yourself to create that positive networking within you and those around you as well as that work environment. Now, the second point that I want to talk about here is going to be, you know, emphasizing the importance of taking care of yourself, right? Making self-care a priority on an ongoing basis. It doesn't slow down. It doesn't go away you need to always constantly be doing it. It is something that's going to continue to help you live longer. And we've already know this. The more stress we in we are in, the longer we're in it, the less pretty much our life expectancy ends up becoming because our body just can't handle being under that kind of stress for so long. So we really need to understand that we need to discuss different ways to adapt to new stressors when they do come into our lifestyle. But by developing a practice of self-care, and, and the idea of improving our well-being to be as resilient and tolerant as possible, it gives us the ability to avoid burnout. Now, the last and final point here is going to be implementing these, these, these strategies that we discussed. If you don't implement them, you're not going to see a change. But I promise if you just throw in one change in there, and that is some breathing work between your transitions from work to home life and home life to work, or vice versa, or however you want to look at it, by implementing some type of self-care practice, even if it's just one and it's brand new to your day, I guarantee you, you'll see a small change. And what that does is it sets you up for that small win, means it gives you the ability to throw in another self-care practice, which then over time, you have small wins that lead to a bigger win, which now you actually feel better, you're performing better in your job, you're more aware within your lifestyle, and you're operating at the level in which you want to operate. And right there, you just self-hack yourself to be the high performer you want to be to prevent burn burnout, as well as enhance overall well-being. And you now become a, a, a mirror of others around you because they now see what you're doing and they want to do the same thing. Again, we inspire ourselves to inspire others. And that's the way we need to view this when it talks about cultivating supportive networks, developing a positive work environment, and developing a very uh, you know positive and healthy balance of an organization, no matter what it is you do to go ahead and cultivate this communication in a very open dialogue to where we are able to take constructive criticism, feedback, and guidance. Final remarks, remember, by implementing these strategies, you're going to go ahead and prevent burnout. By prioritizing self-care, you're going to find that you can achieve success both in your personal and professional life. If you have any questions, please reach out to me at george at gb3athletics.com. And thank you for watching this presentation.